I won't find many people who agree with me on this, but I'm going to say this anyway. I read and hear all the time the phrase, follow your bliss. I think that's wrong. It just doesn't work that way. I think what you should do is follow your opportunities, but take your bliss along. Friends, family, followers, welcome. This is episode 011 of the Doc This 24 and 12 series, where we're interviewing 24 amazing artists, filmmakers, and business players over the next 12 months and bringing the best of those interviews views to you. This week we have documentary composer John Keltonic. John made the jump to making it as a composer shortly after college and hasn't looked back since. What I did not want to be is 60 years old and think, gosh, what if? However, for a talented artist who knows how hard it is to step out into this work and hope everything works out, he has advice for others following his path that might not make your heart sing. Again, I'll go back to the tryouts for American Idol and you look at 40,000 people there. 39,998 of them, or maybe all 40,000 of them, are wrong. They have assessed their skills, they have looked at what the market is like, they have compared themselves to other singers and they've said, yep, this is me. The percentage of people that have judged themselves incorrectly hovers right around 100%. In our time together, he highlights some keys to making it in this work. Why not to follow your bliss and a great piece of advice in his closing words. To realize that no matter what your situation is, there can be a way out of it. There's a way to make this better. I am posing a challenge for my audience. Once you hear John's opinion on bliss and one's ability to assess their own talents, Do you have the same take or a different take? Please share it with us in the comments below or email, Facebook, Twitter, let us know. You know, maybe just to start a little bit of introducing yourself, a a little bit of of what you're doing, where you started and kind of where you are today. Uh, Oh, you want the long and boring history of how I got into this um, morally decrepit career? Is that what you're asking? Uh, How about the the short and exciting? (laughs) Well, sure, short and exciting. I was not a music major. I, although I was hoping to find a career in this, I had no such hope or illusions because, hey, let's get real. Nobody can really make a decent living in music. But when I was in college, I became friends on a social basis with a music professor there, and I would just play him some of my stuff occasionally and back and forth. And he actually kept me out of some of the music classes where I was at the university where I was attending. I was a psych major. He would say, you know, if you go to orchestration class, you'll learn to orchestrate like Berlioz, but you'll lose what you have now. You'll learn to arrange like Haydn, but you'll lose what you have now. So he was working with me on kind of a a one-on-one basis, providing me with opportunities that music majors didn't even have. He was truly my mentor. I mean, there's no really no other way to put it. And when I was, I want to say a junior in college, uh, I think I was a junior, some Hollywood folks decided to put a ton of money into a film about the school. And they asked this professor, whose name is Alan Stein, if he would score the film. And Alan could have done it in a heartbeat. And he said, yeah, I'm kind of busy, but I got this student. So fast forward six or eight weeks later, and I'm waving my arms in front of a whole room full of musicians thinking, well, this is cool. I'd like to do this again. So after college, I I did music part-time for a number of years while I had a full-time career. And it just got to the point where there was just too much going on and I had to either pursue music full-time or give it up and follow the other route. And when I quit my state job, which was a fine state job, but I had a six-year-old daughter and a six-month-old son, I quit my state job in October and I was fairly sure we'd all be dead by Christmas. Wasn't positive, but it sure smelled that way. But I was incredibly fortunate in that uh, I've never had to look back and I made a career at it, actually a good career at it ever since. So there's the short story for you. Does that sort of help? Oh, that's awesome. And yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I know how fortunate I am. There is a uh, an author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell. Don't know if you know him. Brilliant writer. And he's written books on what it takes people. He's written a book and I think He's written so many books, but one, and I think it's this one, it's called Blink, B-L-I-N-K. You can check me on that. But he basically talks about that there are three things for people that they need in order to truly be a success at their career. One is 10,000 hours of work, and I know I put that in. One is access to whatever it is that you are trying to succeed in, and he refers to both Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, who grew up a few few houses away from, you know, the guy who owned Hewlett-Packard or the college that let them use their computer at night. And then a mentor is the 
the third thing. And I was very fortunate to have all three of those. And I think that's one of the, the reasons I get to do what I, what I actually love. And people pay me for it. It's uh, it's pretty stunning. I think one piece that I found out of, out of your story is in all of that, there was clearly a moment where you had to leave stability. Oh, yeah. And go out. And, and I'm curious, like, how did you... You know, it you, you sounded like you had a family at the time. Did you have a family? Had a, I had a wife. Aaron was, uh, I guess, five and a half, um, almost six. And my son, David, was six months old. Yeah. So because I thought about it, I think before I jumped, I think that almost makes it a clear cut case of premeditated stupidity because I thought about it first. <laughs> um, we had done, I'm, I try to be fairly practical. We had some money in the bank. I was doing music on the side and what I would not have been able to support my family on it, but it was, you know, the first year I did it, I probably made 800 bucks. And then the next year I made 1500 bucks a year. And then the year after that, maybe I made $4,000. And the year after that, I made $7,000. So it was, you could see it was starting to pick up. There were people that were coming back to me. Um, and so it wasn't a blind jump. I know, and you probably do too, so many people who have made that jump to the career that they wanted and it didn't take, it didn't last. And so six months later, they're back flipping burgers and eight months later, they're back trying to be a producer and a year later they're back trying to sell real estate and it's this back and forth thing and life's kind of short and I didn't want to do that I only wanted to make the jump once so I had enough part-time clients that I thought it was worth the risk um, I had an incredibly supporting wife who said yeah you know what baby you need to do this I had friends who were encouraging me I had clients who said you know yeah if you make the jump we can certainly use you more so it was a risk and looking back it doesn't feel like much of a risk but you know the day I turned in my resignation was one of the scarier days of my life I I, I was almost joking with you when I said I thought we'd all be dead by Christmas, but it wasn't totally out of the realm of possibility. What I did not want to be is 60 years old and think, gosh, what if? I, I do know what you're talking about. And at some level, I am that person because I have kind of gone back and forth. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and, and it sounds like I'm hearing like a lot of pillars with regards to kind of how you looked at it, you assessed it, you had the clients in place. I did. Internally, are there any like coping skills for the down times? <laughs> are there any like, how do you deal with those moments where it's like, okay, we've only got so much money to the next paycheck and and do you call people do you how, do you go out and uh, well you got to realize when you make the jump there are no paychecks anymore there is no regular income so if you're talking about a uh, gut wrenching before i made the jump or after because there's there's wrenching of guts on both sides of that. I, I think they're both equally kind of interesting. Like, I mean, I feel like you have to know that you, you you may have had skills that you inherited from your parents or from other people in the past, or maybe you just had the fortitude and the commitment. Like some people, their commitment okay. waivers. What you're asking, each one of your questions deserves about a 20 minute response. And I don't think we have the time for that. There were several things that were indicators for me. And I guess I can't put it any stronger than that because you never know until you jump. You and I know that there are hundreds of thousands of people who want to be in the artistic field and not 1% of them will make it. Probably not one-tenth of 1% will make it. You know, look at TV when they have, uh, used to have American Idol auditions and you go to Atlanta and you have 40,000 people there or whatever the number is. Every one of these people thinks they have a real shot. They really do. But a lot of these people not only want to do this, but they are convinced there's some part of them that they have the skills and the talent to pull this off. And they're wrong. They don't. And so I think for anybody to consider this, to be blind to the work around you, to be blind to the opinions you're getting. You know, I have friends who are absolutely sure that they're brilliant songwriters and they're not. I got to say, first off, I'm lo I'm loving every minute of this. We dumped, oh, cool. we jumped, we jumped right into the deep end. And <laughs> I want, I want a little bit of but before I get this, but I, I, I want to just put a pin in this. I, I want a little bit of what you're doing today so I can put context to this. But before I do that, I have to I have to ask, you talked about so many artists not knowing where their work falls on the spectrum. And right. I, I'm so fascinated by this because I've got this new thing that I've been doing where it's like one of my mantras where it's like I, I look at the, I look, weekly I try to look, for example, I've been trying to lose weight. So I weekly I weigh myself. Not uh -huh. more than once, 
because I don't want to obsess, but <laughs> once a week, I okay. look at that number and I say, this is where you're at. And yeah. so when you talk about those artists that are like, I, they, they, and I'm guilty of this too, at some level, they're like, I can make it. I can, I could, I, I could do what that sure. guy's doing at a professional level, but they can't. Right. What's the skill? How, how do people look at their work and measure it up and are, how can they be more honest with themselves? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the most the obvious answer is I'm not sure you can. If you, again, I'll go back to the tryouts for American Idol and you look at 40,000 people there, 39,998 of them, or maybe all 40,000 of them are wrong. They have assessed their skills. They have looked at what the market is like. They have compared themselves to other singers and they've said, yep, this is me. The percentage of people that have judged themselves incorrectly hovers right around 100%. So the first thing that should tell you is you are probably your own worst judge. And I don't think most people realize that. So to assume that you are your own best judge, I think is can often be not only an error, but a fatal error. I won't find many people who agree with me on this, but I'm going to say this anyway. I read and hear all the time the phrase, follow your bliss. I think that's wrong. It just doesn't work that way. I think what you should do is follow your opportunities, but take your bliss along. I don't think you should ignore your bliss, but I think there are a whole lot of people who, because they love doing something so much, they are convinced that it's what they should be doing. And history will show you that there's almost 100% chance that they're wrong. Mm. How's that for discouraging? <laughs> well, <laughs> you're, you're it, welcome. That- I know. I'm it's, here all week. Don't forget to tip your waitress. Yeah. No. Oh, brutally <laughs> honest. Brutally well, it, honest. It is. I mean, I gave a day long lecture series at a university not too far from here. I hate to use this word because it has so many bad connotations. I won't say I'm a Christian, but I absolutely am. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm much better with that. And so I was asked to speak about what do they call it? An artist of faith in a secular world or something like that. But anyway, I sat at this university and there were 60, six, zero film score majors, all of them sure that they were going to make it. I don't think any of them will. And I would not tell them that, but I let them know the realities of the landscape are harsh and they are getting harsher. Chances of making a living in music now are less than half of what they were 15 years ago. And the odds are going down. In Nashville today, there are 80% less full-time songwriters than there were 10 years ago, 80% less. That's a huge shift. My understanding of millennials, and I talked to so many of them, what, uh, what success is for them is hits on YouTube or a kind of thing that you can't make a living from. That's totally fine um, for them. But what that means is their chance of actually being able to do this for a living, unless you know they have an incredibly rich relative, is pretty close to zero. No. Question. Do you see do you see yourself as a pessimist? No. If I were a pessimist, I wouldn't be in this business. I I, I have to think every day. First of all, I'm just so grateful that I get to do this for a living. I, I prefer to say that I'm a yeah, let's see, an optimistic realist. Because I'm I'm telling you that maybe one out of those forty thousand people in Atlanta may make it. I think that's an optimistic number. How's that? All right. That well and the <laughs> and the second question is I, You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I, no, I I love it. I really do, and, and I'm enjoying this. But at the same time, it, it is it is a painful truth. But I think it's a it's a good thing for people to hear. I've got so many thoughts that spiral out of this. You know, one, if someone had told you this when you were starting out, uh-huh. would it change where you are today? No, no. <laughs> It, the, it, the only thing that might have changed is when I made the jump. You got to go back to what I said 20 minutes ago, feeling very fortunate, getting all this encouragement from all kinds of sources. Now, I'm not talking about relatives. It's not your Aunt Ruth who says, that's a wonderful song. That's that's irrelevant. It's the guy that you don't know who went, who you play something at a bar and he goes, I've never heard that before. Where can I buy that CD? And you'd tell him, yeah, sorry, I just wrote that three hours ago. Um, that kind of feedback is certainly helpful. Did that sort of answer your question or maybe I'm going off on a tangent? No, no, that, that answers that you had a clear um, spiral of talent in there and, and that you had a lot well, of affirmation. And- and determination. Like I said, I was willing to beat my head against that wall. And I would have not minded doing that. Uh, it took me, this is absolutely true, from the time I left college until the time I was making a full-time career in music and made that jump was eight years. Eight years. That's a long time to be doing a nine to five, getting home, writing for you know the local 
TV news station and stuff till eight o'clock and then going and playing gigs from eight until three in the morning. That's a long time to be doing that. But it's something that I did not want to be if I wasn't going to give it a, a complete wholehearted effort. There's no point in doing it. You know, give it my best shot and see what happens. Skill, talent and determination. Those are the three did, words. Did I, did I mention stupidity? You got to be. Yeah. Okay. Right. You didn't add that one. No. I... OK. No, that's that's right up there at the top. You got to be stupid to want to do this for a living, man. Um, but no. Skill, talent, and determination. And stupidity. What order? Of, <laughs> what order of importance? Talent number one, because that's uh, there's part of that that you have. Determination almost right there next to it. Skill close to irrelevant because you can learn that. Any, you can learn a skill as long as you've got some basic tools. I mean, if you can hear well, um, you can pick up how to conduct it well enough to conduct your own scores. You can pick up music programs, software, and you can learn this stuff. Being open to criticism, being open to people who have comments. Any artist, when you create something, probably, in most cases, when you create it, it's just God's gift to the world. And so when you play it for your client or show it to your client and they go, yeah, that's not what I was thinking. The first gut reaction is to think, this client is an idiot. This client doesn't recognize my raw talent and skill, that's absolutely the wrong way. This is such a collaborative industry. I have to tell you, uh, and here's a really good example. I just finished a film called The Sultan and the Saint. I'm working with lots of musicians and the director was fairly new. So when he came to me with one of the scenes, he said to me, I can hear what you're doing here. Would you would you try it this way instead? My gut reaction was to think, well, no. That lasted a tenth of a second. And I remembered my history of how I've learned so much from so many. And I went, sure, I'll try it that way. And I went back and tried it. And you know what? It was better. This guy who has virtually no experience in the film, in this industry, taught me because he had an idea that was brilliant. I don't know if I would have thought of it on my own. My guess is I would not have, but I'm so thankful I was able to listen to him because I tried it his way and crap, it was better. And so I'm thankful for that. See, now I'm, now I'm, now I'm starting to hear kind of some of the tenets that I, that I feel like resemble those elements of success. Question for you. Hi, so I got a couple of high questions. Favorite part of this work for you? The most enjoyable part is when I'm getting to work with a small or medium, sometimes large orchestra. And for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, all I have been doing is putting black dots on white paper. That's it. There's very little music involved. It's a very solitary thing. And I've got five, six, seven, eight hundred pages of this stuff lying all over my studio. Put it in binders, trudge up to the studio, you know, get it all printed out, get the orchestrator's working. And the first time I lift my hands up in front of the orchestra and hit the downbeat and it turns from black and white notes into music, I go, oh yeah, this is why I do this. It's that first five second rush where you hope it's going to sound like you've been planning for it to sound. And most of the time it sounds even better. And you look through the control room glass and you look at your client and your client's eyes are as big as saucers and he can't believe how great it sounds. And you're thinking, yeah, baby. <laughs> so that's, that's probably at that five second. I'll go through weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of crap for that five second hit the first time I bring my hands down on the downbeat and everybody gets it. It's very cool. I got goosebumps. I, I absolutely, <laughs> because even to, I've been working on my writing and even today I was doing some writing and I was like, how crazy is it? I'm doing kind of um, just, what do they call it? Stream of consciousness. Sure. So I'm like, how crazy is it that I'm thinking this and now I'm seeing it? And for you, yeah. it's got to be even more amazing where it's like, I'm thinking this and then I'm writing this and now, wow, what I thought I'm seeing and hearing. And it, yeah. well, it's such a powerful medium. Yeah. It, it's been in my head for weeks and all of a sudden in about three seconds it goes from in my head to in this to this very large room with no windows and a whole lot of musicians playing stuff and I'm going oh yeah okay I, I remember now yeah, but that's probably my favorite moment hardest part of uh, or the or a hardest a uh, uh, most challenging moment or a hardest part of this work for you challenging moment there'll be two different answers challenging moment is when you're waving your arms in front of people and they play something and you think that doesn't work that really doesn't work at all. And I've got 40 people in the room and they're all getting paid several hundred dollars an hour. And the client is looking at you through the glass and you're thinking, oh man, if I take a 10 minute break, it's going to cost me eight grand. What do I do here? That's challenging. And uh, the most challenging part of what I do as a living would probably be the PR stuff, which everybody tells me I need to do more of, which is just the whining and dining and the wheeling and dealing it just doesn't interest me at all. I don't dislike it, but I like it the least. Like is probably the way to put it. I, I can relate with you at some <laughs> level on that. I really can. Yeah. And last thing, years from now, you're kind of at the end of your career. Maybe it's something for your son. Maybe it's something for the people that you've worked with or people that have heard your work. If you sure. could choose one thing about you, about your character oh uh, that you could pass on, what would that be and why? 
I go to Uganda virtually every year. This is a, not a musical answer, by the way. Um, but I watched a kid die because the mom couldn't afford a buck sixty-eight for the tetanus shot. So we just watched him die. So since then, I have met with virtually every doctor, every nurse that I know. And basically, in the course of a year, I get enough uh, donated supplies, new medical supplies to fill two 40-foot long containers. Each of them is about 26 tons that we ship to Uganda every year. Each one of these containers conservatively saves about the life of 550 people. That's what I hope my kids get from me, that um, my very dim-sided but growing understanding of God's love for me and his desire for me to share that with other people. They may have a, a having a worse life. This is no reason to look down on them. If anything, this is a reason to say, you know, how can I help? The musical answer is... <laughs> I hope that they inherit some sense of my determination to realize that no matter what your situation is, there can be a way out of it. There's a way to make this better. That's not a pessimistic answer. That's an optimistic answer. It, there is a way to improve this. Things may suck now. What can we do to make this better? It's the old, you know, either, you know, curse the darkness or light a candle thing, I guess. Friends and followers, I asked you this in the intro. Do you agree with John's take on following your bliss? And how do you assess your talent against others? Leave a comment in the comment section below. Send an email. Let us know what you think. And if you learned something today, pass it on. Let's grow this community. I'm signing off. This is Barry Walton. Until next 24 and 12, keep doing what you love.